The Wheat School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by CNMC, Syngenta Canada, and the Alberta Wheat Commission. Welcome back to Real Agriculture's Wheat School series. I am Kara Oosterhouse, and I have here with me Dr. Constanza of the University of Saskatchewan. How's it going today? Great, thank you. Great conference, by the way. I'm super happy and excited to be here. Absolutely. Okay, so we are talking about uh, bacterial leaf streak. It's uh, it's something you've worked on. Do you want to talk a bit about some of your research? Sure. Um, well, I've been working on bacteria leaf streak since I joined the cereal and flax pathology group at the University of Saskatchewan. That would be two years, two years and two months. Uh, yeah, we have three projects right now to come up with the tools to manage the disease here in Canada. So we're hearing a lot more. I, I mean, I'm going to conferences and you're hearing a lot more about bacteria leaf streak. So what's the reasoning there? Numbers picking up in the prairies or, or like it's not a new disease? Yeah, uh, like you mentioned, it's not a new disease. It was reported like more than 100 years ago. And in the U.S., it has been a recurrent problem for a number of years now. And it has made its way to Canada, I'll say. And, um, well, there's a number of reasons uh, why the number of occurrences has increased here in Canada, in the world. But there are some other factors also increasing the number of uh, reports here in Canada, like sprinkler irrigations, trigger crop rotations, probably the widespread use of fungicide applications because of the high yielding, but also highly susceptible cultivars. Uh, probably no tilling system and more awareness of the farmers, I'll say. So we're in Southern Alberta right now in a high irrigation area. Do you want to talk about how irrigation impacts the disease? Yeah, certainly irrigation plays a key role there. It creates the perfect condition to for the bacterial to disperse and infect uh, because uh, infected material kind of releases um, bacterial cell masses as bacterial ooze and that kind of splashes around and how it contaminates like neighboring plants. Uh, so definitely irrigation is a crucial factor when it comes to the environment, the conducive environment for bacterial leaf streak. So wh what, is it, what is it caused by then entirely? Mm -hmm. So it's caused by a bacterium. Um, it's a different microorganism that a fungi. Actually, it's caused by a group of bacteria. Uh, there are different pathobars affecting our cultivated cereal, cereal sorry, and not cultivated, not cultivated cereals like, uh, um, for instance, grassy, weedy grasses uh, or forages, for example. Not only wheat, barley, you know, rye, oats. So yeah, there's caused by um, a gram-negative group of bacteria, and as it's a different microorganism. The tools for managing the disease could be more challenging than fungi. So you mentioned in your presentation today that there's bacterial leaf streak and then there's bacterial bla oh, right. black chaff. Is that what it is? Yeah, bacterial black chaff. Uh, yeah, definitely. The same pathogen when it causes symptoms on the leaves, it's called bacterial leaf streak and it has particular symptoms. Whereas when the pathogen is infected the spike, uh, it's called bacterial black chaff. Uh, and there's a reason why we said bacteria black shaft because the black shaft usually was referred to a uh, kind of a phenomenon occurring uh, in some cultivars that have um, resistant genes against rust. When they were exposed to the sun, they would kind of develop a particular color. So to do not mix and match those two different uh, things, one is uh, a disease and the other one is not, we call it bacteria black shaft. Uh, but yeah, it causes typical symptoms of streaky, sharp streaky um, dark areas on the glooms and also alternating bands of healthy and uh, diseased tissue if it's a known variety. So with bacterial leaf streak, is, is it seed borne? Is there is seed testing a management technique? Oh, okay, yeah. That's very crucial. And as I mentioned to the audience, I cannot stress this enough. The pathogen is notoriously seed borne. Uh, Thank God there are a few uh, options in the industry. There are some labs that are testing, uh, like the 2020 seed lab, they do a PCR. Uh, we also do PCR. We also are aiming to come up with a seed test right now to quantify the levels because, okay, then you have it, but how much? Uh, usually what we would do, we do serial uh, dilutions that we would see that, but um, there's there are other molecular techniques like qPCR that could indicate you uh, like how much of bacterial cells you're having. Um, yeah, so definitely start as clean as we can uh, would be very, very important for 
um, managing the disease. Now you mentioned some of the diagnostic tools we have here. Why is it important that producers are gonna go out to their fields, actually collect those samples and then report those samples? Um, well, it is important um, because it, when it comes to wheat, barley, sometimes the farmer, they save some, feed, some seed and they use the same seed for the next year. So definitely if you, you had an issue, you want to know if it was there, if you're planning to use that seed for the next season, uh, you want to know how much you have because that would indicate you if you should, how you, you were going to manage your irrigation system in case you have one. Um, doesn't mean that the disease is actually going to be showing up. It's very important to keep in mind that uh, as a disease, it depends a lot on the environment too. Uh, so that's why the farmer should be aware and scout and keep good records of what they have. So when diagnosing it in your field, one of the things you said to kind of look out for is bacterial ooze. Do you want to talk about what bacterial ooze is? Yeah, uh, bacterial ooze is basically millions of thousands, thousands of millions of bacterial cells um, that are all together in kind of like a milky drops, droplets onto the lesions that, that appears when the conditions are super, super humid. And then what it happens is that the bacterial uh, cell masses kind of ooze out of the lesions. Um, and then if we have like suddenly we have droughty condition, it kind of dries out and it becomes like a shiny, shiny scales, like a, like a shellac, uh, kind of a donut, donut glaze appearance. Um, yeah. So what sort of conditions does this disease like, Are, like, like you kind of mentioned where you're going to find it, but as conditions change, you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, um, they definitely do like a lot of moisture. Bacteria don't do well on the drought conditions. Uh, it likes temperature in between 15 to 30 degrees. Of course, uh, the higher the temperature, the faster they multiply. And that's why we usually see it more often at the last stages of the crop cycle. Um, again, uh, thunderstorm systems kind of pick up a lot of dust, debris, and the bacteria, of course, and moves it around. Um, I was mentioning to... Um, to the audience in Alberta, you have a specific condition because because you live close to the mountains, you have warm days and cool nights, and that uh, leads to dew formation. So dew formation uh, creates free water on the surface of the leaf, and that kind of helps the bacteria to penetrate because the bacteria are super super tiny. Uh, they are ten times uh, smaller than the opening of a stomata, so they kind of penetrate kind of in a passive way. They're not, uh, you know, genera generating specific structures like spores, like the rust will do. So they can enter through nat natural openings like stomata or hydatodes, or through wounds like caused by feeding insects, hail, or even machinery. Uh, there's also other phenomena like ice nucleation that the bacteria will cause. Uh, so yeah, that's how they penetrate and infect. So what are what's available for management techniques? Are are fungicides effective against it? No, uh, it's really important to mention that because bacteria have different microorganisms and fungi, fungicides don't work, uh, so it won't be effective. And even if it were any bacteris bactericide, because of the replication times is so short. Uh, if you have the condition, you have the weather, you have the pathogen in a susceptible host. Um, you have you will have to be reapplying so many times during the crop cycle that it wouldn't be economical. So what we shoot for is like kind of an integrated approach. Basically, we know that chemical control is not an option right now, or they're not effective chemical seed or foliar. Uh, so we need to play it out with genetic resistance and cultural practice, like checking your seed before seeding it, um, crop rotation, um, among among other other tools. Yeah. Now, I know a question when we're kind of looking at some of these diseases is the producer is going to go, okay, so what? How does it actually impact their final yield? What? Why is it so important that we're actually managing this disease? Well, um, unfortunately, the number of reports of yield losses um, are not as high as compared to other fungal diseases like rust that are well studied as compared to bacterial leaf streak. But um, yield losses can go from... 10 to up to 40% of your losses, uh, because what the bacterial does, it kind of decreases the green area of the, of the crop. So less green area, less photosynthesis, less carbohydrates going through the grain. 
Um, so that's how it reduces the green yield. So you will have less thousand kernel weight, less, you know, less yield overall, but it could also affect the quality as well. Let's not forget that's super important in Canada as well, because it kind of, the grain will be shriveled and you can, it can change the grain protein concentration as well, because less carbohydrate than higher uh, protein concentration. Uh, yeah, just um, if you think that you might have an issue, just reach out, uh, learn how to recognize it, uh, keep good records, um, reach out to your agronomist or extensionist. They will know where to find like um, seed testing or sample testing, and then they will reach out to us. We do need to collect a lot of isolates to keep our projects going. We wanna know what we have in Canada. And for that, it's super important to, to get uh, samples uh, from the farmers. Okay, sounds good. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.